The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. It is imperative that you name your sins to God, for in doing so, you are said to be filled with God the Holy Spirit, and that is the power of our unique spiritual life. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things which we have forgotten. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to assemble ourselves together under freedom on a Wednesday night. And may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us uh, to the portion of the word which we are going to study tonight. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we've been studying the sins of the tongue. And we're going to continue with this subject tonight. And we're going to take a look at the sins of the tongue as listed in James. And as I've told you before, the book of James is nearly entirely a book of application. And James was a practical man and he loved to give application when it came to the Word of God. So we will be starting in the book of James, and, uh, and there will be a lot of experiential application that comes from that, especially related to the sins of the tongue. And uh, James emphasizes the fact that verbal sins are always motivated by mental attitude sins. And what is a mental attitude sin? An uh, anger. If you get angry at someone, then that might result in a verbal sin in which you gossip and malign about that person. So turn in your Bible to James 3.14. James 3.14. And this is where it says, But if you have bitter jealousy, and this is a corrected translation, but if you have bitter jealousy and inordinate ambition in your right lobe, and you do, that's the if there, stop being arrogant and stop lying against the truth. So this is referring to gossip and slander, and it's referring to lying against the truth. When people slander you, they are lying against the truth. And so you lie about someone in order to tear them down and at the same time build yourself up. Now, last time we looked at something on the board, and today it's going to look a lot better because I had Dallas draw it before class because I am no artist whatsoever. Okay, so we see here the created idol and his feet of clay, and then down here is the idol creator, and he is the arrogant believer. So the, the arrogant believer creates an idol out of this person up here because he thinks this person up here is spiritual or has a great personality and uh, he really gets a rapport with this person and they really get along great. And so this arrogant believer makes an idol out of this person. And notice it says a created idol. This person didn't even want to be an idol. Uh, he was just going along and somebody, uh, they, he, the, the uh, arrogant believer his eye was caught by this person, and therefore uh, he thinks he's a great spiritual person. So this is a created idol, created by the arrogant believer. And then one day, uh, the arrogant believer suddenly notices a sin that his created idol commits. And he will, because we all commit sins. But his sin is going to be outside of this person's uh, area of weakness. This person usually is going to be a legalist, one who likes to gossip, malign, and judge, a self-righteous person, somebody who thinks they are righteous because of who and what they are. And then this person up here might have a totally different trend, probably lasciviousness or antinomianism. So this one up here likes to go to bars or uh, just likes to uh, go out and uh, commit a different brand of sin uh, such as fornication, the lascivious type. And you should know what lascivious is. So this is this one. So suddenly, this person who is self-righteous sees this person commit a sin that this person would never commit. And so he sees the feet of clay. And then what happens when the idol 
see when the uh, person who creates the idol sees that feet of clay, he all of a sudden has a change of mind about that person and he becomes an idol smasher. So suddenly he puts himself above this person. Now this person had nothing to do with any of this. And, but this person in reaction to this person says, well, I would never do something so disgusting. In fact, I must be better th than this person. So he gossips and maligns this person because he's disillusioned. He's disillusioned by the created idol. So all of a sudden the arrogant believer who was down here puts himself up here and starts smashing the very idol he created. So he starts smashing this person into the ground through gossip, maligning, and judging. So he tries to destroy his own created idol. And in doing so, suddenly, for the first time, this person starts to feel a little bit of power. And uh, he starts to feel... What, happen, what happens is, really, he starts to look around and he sees that there are a lot of people who, who commit the same sins as his former idol. So he says, you know what? I'm better than all of those people. I myself am an idol. So then what happens in his arrogance is the arrogant believer will create an idol out of himself. And let me center that for you. And that's still under the heading iconoclastic arrogance. So the arrogant believer says, you know, I'm really better than everybody else because everybody I come in contact with sins. Well, of course they do. Everybody sins. But he sets himself up as an idol because he's so self-righteous, he can't see himself. Uh, he can't even hardly see his sins. He's so blinded to him. So the arrogant believer creates an idol of himself. Now down here are a group of believers, and they have the same trend, <coughs> legalism. They're all legalistic and self-righteous. So he seeks the approval, and that's what this says here, seeking approval, and that's approbation lust, and that's a sin but he doesn't know it. So he's seeking the approval of these believers, and there are believers, yet they are legalistic, and he seeks their approval uh, by his self-righteousness. Well, these people respond, and they give him approval and pat him on the back and tell him uh, what a wonderful person he is. And then it's a vicious, vicious, vicious cycle of legalism in which everybody's patting everybody on the back about how great they are, and this is when you have the legalistic club, and that's what's formed. And oftentimes, churches are no more than this, a legalistic club where everybody goes around and tell, tells each other how great they are. Yet we're all sinners, and uh, none of us are great because we don't sin, because we will sin. It's the spiritual life that makes one uh, great, per se, but even that's by grace. If we are great in the spiritual life, that's the grace of God. The Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul, believe me, was a great man. So, uh, James 3.16 also, right after James 3.14, James 3.16 says, For where jealousy and inordinate ambition exist, there is dissension and every evil or worthless deed. In other words, the sins of the tongue, when you gossip and malign and judge someone, that is worthless, and it is evil, and that is what James is saying. And then, if you want to skip ahead to James 4, 5, this is another listing of the sins of the tongue. James 4, 5, Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose against jealousy, you see, jealousy is the motivator. If you have jealousy in your soul, that's going to motivate you to have verbal sins. So you see how James focuses on the motivation, and the motiv motivation is the mental attitude sins. And jealousy is a mental attitude sin. And if you have jealousy, soon you're going to have verbal sins in which you're going to talk about the person with whom you are jealous. And then it continues in James 4, 5. The Spirit who dwells in us pursues us with love. And what is the Spirit? That's God the Holy Spirit. And if you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you're not into this gossip and maligning back and forth among uh, believers uh, because that destroys your spiritual life. 
the 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 filling of God the Holy Spirit is love. There is talking about the advanced spiritual life where you have imper impersonal love for mankind or personal love for God the Father and impersonal love personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for mankind working in tandem, but that is an advanced doctrine, but that's just a preview of coming attractions, and that's what that's talking about. So in other words, this scripture is telling you that uh, you, you're not aware of your jealousy, and you're not aware that it is a great motivator of your sins of gossip, maligning, and judging. And you see here that the mental attitude of jealousy is parlayed into the sins of the tongue. And James is warning against jealousy so that you do not fall into that trap. Now James 4.11 is another verse in James that deals with this subject where it says, Brethren, stop slandering each other. He who slanders a fellow believer or judges a fellow believer slanders and judges Bible doctrine, which is the law of God. Your Bible might say the law of God. Well, that's Bible doctrine. And if you uh, judge or slander another believer, you might as well count yourself as a blasphemer. You're slandering the very word of God because, first of all, it tells us not to do it. And secondly, Jesus Christ is the ultimate judge, and we don't want to put ourselves in the place of Jesus Christ. He'll take care of everything. We don't need to act like a judge. Jesus Christ is the judge. James 5, 9. James 5, 9. It says here, Brethren, do not complain against each other that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And we can take some points about that because if you know something about uh, Revelation, there's something there that's talking about knocking at the door, and this is related to that. So point one, when you start judging, the judge, Jesus Christ, is standing at the door. This means you're out of fellowship. Uh, Jesus Christ is no longer dining with you, as it says, in fellowship as per Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, when you are restored to fellowship with God as a Christian, Jesus Christ is said to dine with you and you with him. And that is your fellowship with the Lord. So when it says that Jesus Christ is standing at the door, that means you are out of fellowship. And why? Because you've been judging and maligning people. So it, as it were, you know how cold it is outside right now? It's just as if you slam the door on Jesus Christ and he's standing there waiting for you to rebound so he can come in and dine with you. Now, that's, a, that's an analogy. Of course, Jesus Christ is not cold. He's very happy. He will always be that way. But for us to understand this, this is how it is framed. So, uh, you don't want to leave Jesus Christ locked out. Now, he's going to be in you anyway. But this is talking about fellowship. You should want to be in fellowship. And when you judge and malign people, you are not in fellowship. Point two, this also anticipates the fact that our Lord is about to punish those involved in gossip, maligning, and judging. Just as it says in Revelation chapter 2, it says, I stand at the door. And not only does Jesus Christ just stand at the door, what does he start doing? And what is that? Discipline. He's trying to wake you up. And the first knock is maybe like that. And you don't listen. And you say, I don't want to. I'm still going to judge. And the second knock is a lot louder. And then uh, eventually he just blows your house away and you're dead. That's called the sin face to face with death. And we'll study that in the future. So there is intensified divine discipline when it comes to the sins of the tongue. And the house, by the way, I'm talking about the temple, your, your body getting blown away through death, destruction. There is the intensified divine discipline against the sins of the tongue. Point one, there is no category of sins which bring such concentrated divine discipline to the believer as those who are involved in the sins of the tongue. In other words, if you want to get a quick spanking from God, go to the sins of the tongue and he will punish you severely. It's actually uh, where you will get some of the worst punishment is from the sins of the tongue. And there's a reason for this. But first of all, let's uh, divide the sins of the tongue into three different categories. 
uh, there is the slander category, and there is that. I put subpoint A because that was point two where I said the sins of the tongue include three categories. I just went ahead and put subpoint A, the slander category. Subpoint B, there is the falsehood category, such as untruth, deception, misrepresentation, perjury, fabrication, pathological lying, distortion, equivocation, ambiguous and unclear expressions designed to mislead, verbal du duplicity, and hypocrisy. In other words, uh, the best what uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind when I was uh, thinking about verbal duplicity is uh, some of you might not know what this means, but uh, uh, one time somebody said, "Well, it depends on what the uh, meaning of the word is is." And uh, you might not know who that you younger people probably don't know who I'm talking about. Some, uh, but it doesn't matter. You shouldn't know who I'm talking about. But that's duplicity. If somebody says, did you sleep with that woman? Now, this is in a court of law. I'm not talking about judging. This is in a court of law, and they say, uh, did you sleep with that woman, or are you sleeping with that woman? And then they will say, well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. That's duplicity, and uh, we've had that in our history as a country. Point C, there is the whining and complaining Category. Now, if you've ever been around people who whine and complain, especially in the workplace, well, they just, they, they about, they get on my nerves, they shouldn't, but when you hear people always complaining, and they sit at their desk, and they're making a good wage and filling their bellies, and yet all they do all day is complain about all the terrible things that they're going through, well, that's part of the, the sins of the tongue. So, um, and we all know whiners, and they are irritating. And this uh, category is complaining when, in fact, you're blessed by God and you're a beneficiary of His grace. And this means you are disoriented to the grace of God. And this is whimpering, whining, grumbling, or complaining by a believer who has his own portfolio of, of invisible assets. And what's that mean? You've been given more in this unique spiritual life, in this dispensation, than has ever been given before. There is no need to grumble whatsoever. Now, uh, complaining is contradictory to the plan of God and because He has a plan for us, and we are royal family, and royal family should not complain. We have no right to complain. There is one exception, however, and uh, I, I looked up, I looked this, and there actually is one exception, and that is there is no le a legitimate expression of pain, and that's not related to the sins of the tongue. If you're in a lot of pain and you say, it hurts, you're, well, it does hurt, and you're going to express your pain because pain can get very, uh, uh, very unbearable at times. So, but that has nothing to do with the sins of the tongue. So, if you break your leg, don't think that if you uh, if you don't uh, if you you have to be quiet all the time and they drag you to the hospital and if you're not going and if you're going ah and they say well you're sinning no you're not you're in pain of course you're gonna make some noise about it. So when we're in pain, we may groan and we may do that, but that has nothing to do with sin. This right here, the sins of the tongue, is talking about the sniveling of arrogance. And that's what this is talking about when you complain in arrogance. And then point three, the sins of the tongue carry liability for triple compound discipline. And I'll write this on the board, triple compound discipline. And this is very important. And in fact, the sins of the tongue are the only sins that carry triple compound discipline. And it's, uh, you, you should, by the time this message is over, you should be so scared that you probably won't talk for about four days. I'm just joking. Well, just don't gossip. So, uh, triple compound discipline. And why is it triple compound discipline. Why is it triple? Well, we'll look at that. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verse 7. Matthew 1, 7.
it, <coughs> right here it says, Stop judging so that you will not be judged. So here we see that believers are ordered by God to stop slandering, maligning, or judging others. The sins of the tongue involve two categories of sinfulness related to Christian degeneracy. There are mental attitude sins, uh, which motivate verbal sinning, and there is actual verbal sins, and you have to remember this. And uh, you will never slander, malign, judge, or gossip about another person without some motivation from another sin. So you see, it's compound sinning. And that was Matthew 1, 7. It's not. It doesn't say, stop judging so that you will not be judged. <coughs> Maybe it was... Uh, well, it's, it's in... Uh, well, it's in the Bible. So, and it says in the Bible, stop judging so that you will not be judged. And I'll correct that and make a correction for you tomorrow. <coughs> That's embarrassing. I thought it was. Well, I should have known that. That should be in the... I'm about to study Matthew. Okay. Well, just uh, let's just keep going. Here we see that believers are ordered by God to stop slandering, maligning, or judging others. And the sins of the tongue involve two categories of sinfulness related to Christian degeneracy. And uh, Christians can be very degenerate. And mental attitude sins motivate verbal sinning and the actual verbal sins. So you have to remember this, that you will never slander, malign, judge, or gossip about another person without motivation from a mental attitude sin. So you have to think of it kind of like uh, chain smoking. First of all, you have a mental attitude sin. And off of that sin, you light another cigarette right off that other sin, and that would be the uh, slander, maligning, and the verbal. And so you just hit the cycle just like that. So the motivation of verbal sins occurs when there is an oscillation between self-righteous arrogance and self-pity in emotion. Now, how does this work? How can you be self-righteous one minute and then be in self-pity? Well, uh, the self-righteous person, can uh, he's very self-righteous and he thinks he's perfect and he goes through life with this self-righteous attitude. But he is so self-righteous, he's extremely hypersensitive. So what happens is, if somebody crosses him, he immediately switches from his high horse straight down to self-pity. And that's part of his trend in the old sin nature. So he oscillates back and forth. Somebody, uh, somebody uh, insults him, he goes straight to self-pity. Somebody praises him, he goes straight to self-righteousness. Back and forth. And a lot of times these people go bipolar and need to get on some uh, medication. And they should be. Okay. So... Uh, it was Matthew 7. Look at Matthew 7 1 and see what that says. I think I just flipped the yeah, chapter yeah. and verse around. Yeah, that's it. It's Matthew 7 1. Well, that's good. Verbal sins can also involve verbal murder, and that's characterized by character assassination or other, uh, plus the blasphemy of assuming the prerogative of God and judging others. And we talked about that Tuesday night. When you judge somebody, you are actually taking on the prerogative of God. And you are not God. Yet when you judge, you act like God. But you're not. So Matthew 7, 1 describes the first of the two laws that are found in Matthew 7, 1 through 2. And this is called the law of reversal divine punitive action. And this is going to be very interesting when we get into this study of the law of the reversal of divine punitive action. The sins of the tongue carry three categories of liability which will receive punitive action from God. So we're going to take a look at the three facets of divine discipline involved when we commit a verbal sin such as gossip, maligning, or judging. <coughs> Point one. Divine discipline for the mental attitude sin that motivates the sins of the tongue. So here we're going to start to see why triple compound discipline. 
because first of all there is divine discipline for the mental attitude sin that motivates the sins of the tongue for example if you were jealous that uh, divine discipline goes along with jealousy and then there is divine discipline for the verbal sin itself so you're jealous about somebody and then you uh, talk about them and you say something nasty about them and there's discipline involved in that And then there is divine discipline for the assignment of sins to others, real or imagined. In other words, let's say, uh, let's take for example, uh, you see an effeminate man and you really don't like him and maybe he's way high up in the company so you get jealous of this man who's effeminate and way high up in the company. And then, so you have jealousy. So that's a sin. You're going to get punished for that. And then you commit a verbal sin. You say, that guy is a homosexual. So you go around the office and tell everybody how this guy is a homosexual. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's just effeminate. There are effeminate males who are not homosexual. So uh, he's going around telling everybody how this guy is a homosexual. So then, point three, divine discipline for assignment of the sins of others, real or imagined, you get disciplined for homosexuality. Isn't that something? You get disciplined for the jealousy. You get disciplined for the gossip about him being a homosexual. And you get disciplined for being a homosexual, whether you're a homosexual or not. Now that's how serious this is. And that is what triple compound discipline is. Now let's uh, let's say the guy really is a homosexual and you're, you're jealous about him because he's high up in the company and you say he's a homosexual maybe he is so you say this guy's a homosexual guess what any punishment that if he were a believer and a homosexual any punishment that God was going to give to him is going to be cut off and it's going to go to you because you're acting as the judge you're acting as Jesus Christ so his discipline you're wanting him to suffer well you, you, you're suddenly going around naming his sins to everybody all of a sudden his judgment's cut off he receives no discipline for that and it, come, and it falls on you because you've stepped in the way of the Lord the Lord's trying to handle this person you step in the way and so he's going uh, to smite you instead he's going to hit you with discipline so that's how serious this is and it is the only uh, area of sins that receive triple compound. And it should, uh, it should wake you up to the fact that you need to bite your tongue. And one of the greatest signs that you're reaching spiritual maturity is when you avoid the sins of the tongue. If you're avoiding the sins of the tongue, you are either close to spiritual maturity or in spiritual maturity because people who are spiritually mature very rarely use the sins of the tongue. Uh, They sin, of course, but they they avoid that especially because they know of the divine discipline behind it, and it is extremely severe. Now, every sin you name regarding another believer, the sins that you spread around, and you can't wait to tell someone on the phone about how someone else sinned, uh, the, the sin that you name has penalties attached to them. So let's say the person you're talking about actually did commit the sin. If he is guilty of the sins, his discipline, the one who is committing the sin that you are talking about, is removed because the judgment didn't come from heaven. The judgment came from you. So you see it came from your fat mouth, and therefore the the punishment is transferred to your fat mouth. And that's the way God works, because you don't mess with his plan. You don't mess with him and his children. He punishes his children. We have no right to mess in other people's business because when we do so, we're acting as if we are the Lord Jesus Christ and all of us are sinners. So if you gossip about someone and the sins you mention concerning that person are imagined and that person is innocent of those sins, then the person being maligned will receive blessings that would have been comparable to the intensity of the discipline. So long as that believer puts the matter in the Lord's hands and does not try to vindicate himself. In other words, if somebody gossips about you, do not react. By all means, don't react. If you think somebody's gossiping about you, tearing you down at work or wherever you are, don't react to it because great blessing is about to come your way. 
If you leave it in the Lord's hand, the Lord will dump some blessing right in your lap and then that person gossiping, gossiping about you will get smacked down. And you might think, well, it's not happening fast enough. Well, God works in his own time. It might take ten years, and then suddenly that person just drops dead. I've known people, I'm not going to name names, but I've known people who have maligned great pastors in the past. And I know of one who maligned a great pastor and said that this pastor was sleeping with someone in the congregation, and he sent out letters to everybody saying that he was doing that and within 24 hours he dropped dead of a heart attack. You don't mess around with this stuff right here. So if you gossip about some... So let's continue. Sometimes we as, a, as believers have a, have a uh, tendency to get hypersensitive if someone talks about us. We flip out and we get in a tizzy and we just can't stand it uh, when that occurs. So we resort to some type of revenge motivation. And if we do that, we've just canceled out our blessings. We would have gotten blessings if we'd have just left it in the Lord's hands and said, okay, this person's doing me wrong. So what? I'll let the Lord handle them and the Lord will handle them and he'll do a lot better job than you ever could. So don't get in the revenge motivation. And so, and we find this in Romans 12:19. And if you want to turn there, that'll be fine. And this will be the corrected translation of Romans 12:19. Now, what happens to us? We, uh, when we get hurt, we want to get back at the person who has done us wrong. And if we do so, like I said, we're going to lose the blessings that would have come our way if we'd have just left the matter alone and left it in the Lord's hands. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And that would be the principle behind it. So in Romans 12:19, the corrected translation is as follows. Beloved, stop avenging yourselves. Instead, give place to the supreme court of heaven, for it stands written, Punishment belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. So, if, uh, if somebody does you wrong, just remember 12, uh, Romans 12:19. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And that's what the English uh, version says, and it, it's pretty close to the right translation. And that's what you would say in your soul, and therefore you wouldn't have to worry about it, and you can live a peaceful life while the whole world's talking about you, and suddenly blessings rain down on you from heaven, and they get all the punishment and you might want to see them suffer immediately. But God doles it out when he feels like doling it out, when he feels like it's the proper time to dole it out, and it's the right time. Always remember, God's timing is perfect, absolutely perfect. Our timing is not. And sometimes we get in a hurry, we want something to happen right now. Well, God's timing is perfect, and when something is meant to happen, it's going to happen if it's God's will. So if you wish to receive maximum blessing when others are maligning and gossiping about you, you must utilize some Bible doctrine yourself, and that is you should claim Romans 12:19, and therefore you will receive blessing while those gossiping about you will receive severe discipline, and we're talking about triple compound Discipline, the worst type of discipline you can get outside of the sin face to face with death. And if you continue in this gossip and maligning, you will die the sin face to face with death, and that is not pretty at all. So if you are the one who slanders, the victim of your slander is not the one who receives the punishment. You receive the punishment. <coughs> Even if you're mentioning the sins of others, that you yourself did not commit, you will receive the punishment for the mental attitude sins which motivated the verbal sins and also take note that you receive punishment for the sins that you named con uh, concerning the innocent victim. For example, as I, was, I already gave that example of the effeminate male and uh, I think I already made my point with that. So point one, first of all, you receive punishment for the mental attitude sin. Point one. First of all, you receive punishment for the mental attitude sin, and that is the motivator for the verbal sins. You receive punishment for the mental attitude sin, which is the motivator for the verbal sins. Point two. 
You receive punishment for the verbal sin you have committed, which would be gossip, maligning, or judging. And I might have went over this a little earlier, but it doesn't hurt to repeat at all, especially with something this important. Point three, you receive the punishment of the very sin you named concerning that person, and that would, which would be the punishment of whatever sin you named regarding that person. And these three facts, these three facts should really uh, scare you into, scare your tongue into submission. So the next time uh, you have a, a mental attitude sin about somebody and you all of a sudden want to say something, bite your tongue off before you do, or otherwise you'll get triple compound discipline. Now you'll get the discipline for the mental attitude sin, but that's one. It's better than getting triple. It's, it's a very terrible, terrible thing. So Matthew 7, 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and, why, and by what measure you measure, it will be measured against you. And that's what Matthew 7, 2 means. The first sentence in the verse is the law of liability regarding verbal sins. There is no stronger law in the Supreme Court of Heaven. Two categories of sins are involved in liability. There's the mental attitude sins, which motivates the verbal sins of judging, and there is the verbal sins that result. But you're also liable for the content of the sins you name concerning the innocent victim. And this should make you stop and think before you ever again gossip, malign, and judge. But you will. But it should make you think about it. And it should help you to grow spiritually because you'll be filled with God the Holy Spirit more often. And the more you're filled with God the Holy Spirit and the more you take in the Word of God, the faster you grow spiritually. And the faster you grow spiritually, the faster you receive your blessings. Now you'll receive testing along the way. But then again, uh, that testing isn't so bad once you're uh, spiritually mature because you know how to handle it and it almost gets a little fun after a while because you can uh, just uh, name a promise or we'll get to the faithless drill and uh, that'll be uh, probably during the conference. We'll get to the faith rest drill that first week and we'll probably talk about Moses and David and a lot of those things and when we get to the faith rest drill and we get past this uh, the the milk and the faith rest drill is still milk but there's a little meat in there too because uh, that was the highest form of the spiritual life in the Old Testament so there's some meat in the faith rest drill and we'll really get cracking with our spiritual life so we see clearly why three out of the seven worst sins listed in Proverbs are the verbal sins and that's because there's so much involved in it there's so much involved in the verbal sins because we have the mental attitude sin, the verbal sin, and then we actually name a sin somebody has or has not committed, and then there's triple compound discipline. So we see the deep involvement that there is in verbal sins, and that's exactly why it's listed as three of the seven worst sins. And that would be shocking to a lot of people around here that all this time they've been committing the top three worst sins. Uh, but they have been, and that's why uh, we, uh, collectively we might be due for some punishment as a country. So the royal priesthood, and that would be any of us who has believed in Jesus Christ, demands privacy to live your own life as unto the Lord. And you have no right whatsoever to intrude into the privacy of others. They have a unique spiritual life to live, and you have a unique spiritual life to live, and whether they succeed or fail is none of your business. Your business is whether you succeed or fail. And if you want to succeed, be filled with God the Holy Spirit and learn the Word of God. It's as simple as that. It's re it might seem complicated, but it's not. If you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, He'll make these things understandable eventually. Some of the words you might get, but you'll pick up a little bit here and there, here and there. And then eventually, you'll pick it all up, and God the Holy Spirit will help you with that because He is your teacher, and He is your mentor, and He'll bring to your memory those things that you've forgotten. So the more you grow, uh, the more you'll understand these things. So we just noted the law of uh, reversal punitive action. And let me give you a definition of that. And uh, it's called the law of reversal punitive action. And this is what is described in Matthew 7, 2. 
the law of reversal punitive action. The believer who is guilty of verbal sins will always receive the reversal of divine punitive action. In other words, you will always receive the discipline for the other person's sins that you name. You will receive the discipline for your verbal sins and for your sinful motivation. That would be the mental attitude sins in committing the verbal sin. So this is the law of reversal punitive action. The believer who is guilty of verbal sins will always receive the reversal of divine punitive action and you will always receive the discipline for the other person's sins which you name for your verbal sins and for your sinful motivation and that would be the mental attitude sins, anger and jealousy and sins such as that. So there are two categories of sins mentioned in the gossip and slander. There are sins that the believer did commit, the believer that you're talking about, and there are sins that the believer that you're talking about did not commit. And point one, if the believer you gossip about actually did commit the sin that you tell everyone else about, then the punishment of that sin is removed immediately from the one who committed that sin. If the believer you gossip about actually did commit the sin you tell everyone else about, then the punishment of that sin is removed immediately from the one who committed that sin. And why is that? That's because you have acted as the judge. You have acted as the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have decided to punish this person on your own free will. You have in effect said, God, you're not doing your job. I'm going to do it for you. And that's blasphemy in itself. So no wonder there's so much punishment behind it. That is tremendous arrogance to try to push God out of the way and say, let me handle this, God. I know what to do with this person. That's, that's extreme arrogance, and people do it all the time, and yet they don't even know how arrogant they are. And then when they get sick and they're dying or they get under some severe punishment, they don't even know why. And it's sad, but it's their choice because they did not uh, decide to learn the Word of God. Point two, if the believer did not commit the sin that you gossip about him committing, then the innocent victim receives immediate blessing as a result of your unfair slander. And that is if that person doesn't react to your slander. So if you're living your spiritual life, somebody talks about you, you're about to get blessed. And that's a, that's a good thing. So... Uh, we'll have a review of triple compound discipline. Triple compound discipline includes divine discipline for the mental attitude sins that motivate the verbal sins, divine discipline for the actual verbal sins, and the law of reversal of divine punitive action. And on the flip side, now we're getting to the flip side of all of this. I just talked about all the punishment for triple compound discipline. Now we're going to move to the flip side of it. And the flip side of it is that there is great blessing in avoidance of the sins of the tongue. Psalms 34, 12 through 13. On the flip side, there is great blessing in avoidance of the sins of the tongue. And this is found in Psalms 34, 12 through 13. This is where it says, Who is the person who desires long life? Loves length of days that he may see prosperity. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking slander. It is a sign of spiritual maturity when a person avoids the sins of the tongue. For example, David constantly avoided gossiping about Saul even though Saul was constantly seeking David's life. And this was a sign of David's spiritual maturity. And at any point David would have gossiped, he would have been struck in his conscience. And a few times, like one time, he uh, went up to the king while he was asleep and cut a little sliver off his robe. Now, most people wouldn't have thought anything of it because this guy was trying to kill him. But all of a sudden, he was struck in his conscience. And he said, I just, uh, I just rejected authority. I went up and I took a piece of the robe off of the king which would be an example of him trying to usurp authority. And so he was struck in his soul immediately for doing that, and he immediately rebounded. So he was a mature believer, 
and he was and he was always conscious of when he sinned and it's very important that we're conscious when we sin and it's very important that we always keep short accounts of when we sin if we sin be sure to rebound immediately because the more you're filled with God the Holy Spirit the more you will desire the word actually God the Holy Spirit is the actual fire in your belly that makes you want to come here and listen to the word and if you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit well then you're grieving and quenching the spirit and you probably wouldn't care a thing for the word so you need to keep short accounts of rebound you need to rebound consistently and you say but I don't know all of the sins to rebound well uh, one thing you can do uh, that one thing I did when I was uh, a younger believer when I was a teenager when I, I would uh, I would wouldn't know all the sins so uh, I was listening to a tape one time and uh, and uh, the colonel said what uh, arrogance pretty much uh, encapsulates all the sins so from then on I said father I've been arrogant and then you know and then I would be forgiven of all the sins related to that arrogance and that was out of ig out of the ignorance that I didn't know those sins but when you know the sins specifically name them specifically but if you don't and you're wondering what well, have I sinned just name the sin of arrogance that's what I did all right so on the flip side there is a great blessing in the avoidance of the sins of the tongue and we found that in the Psalms and we noted it's a sign of spiritual maturity to avoid the sins of the tongue and now we're going to look at the pattern and the punishment for the sins of the tongue. Psalms 52, 1 through 5. Psalms 52, 1 through 5. And this is where it says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The grace of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor O oh, worker of deceit you love evil more than good this is good of intrinsic value falsehood more than speaking what is right you love all words that destroy O oh, deceitful tongue consequently God will break you down forever he will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent now that doesn't mean God's going to run into the tent that they were sleeping in and tear him out. The tent is the body. He's going to tear him out of his body. In other words, he's going to die and he's going to uproot him from the land of the living. So this is how serious it is when you get involved in the sins of the tongue. Brad, is your watch running slow? <laughs> no? All right. So this is what happens uh, when you get involved in the sins of the tongue. And these sins, uh, it can lead very quickly to the sin face to face with death and we'll be studying the sin face to face with death we'll start on it tomorrow probably uh, after we uh, wrap up a few more things for those who continually practice the sins of the tongue the only thing that awaits them is a terrible death this death is called the sin face to face with death in the Bible and we uh, might take a look at this briefly as we're going to have a detailed study of the sin face to face with death within the next few sessions. And uh, we won't take a look at that briefly. I was going to. Uh, but if you want to know where it is, where it's found, it's 1 John 5.16. That's where the sin face to face with death is found. And you're going to find some interesting things about 1 John 5.16 you're going to find some interesting interesting things about prayer and, and there's going to be certain people you cannot pray for and that's going to be interesting to see and I'm not making it up it's found in the Bible and if you want to look it up it's going to say for these people I do not say you should pray and that's for the people dying to sin face to face with death now that doesn't mean you run around judging people saying, well, is he dying to sin face to face with death? No, that doesn't. But we'll get into that in more detail and it's going to be an interesting study in 1 John 5, 16. So, believers, uh, let's take a point and this is an important point. Believers living the unique spiritual life have deliverance from the sins of the tongue. In other words, if we're living the unique spiritual life, we are delivered from the sins of the tongue. 
constantly delivered from the sins of the tongue. This is found in Job 5.19. In Job 5.19. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to, you can. But I'll just go ahead and read it. In six troubles, he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. In famine, he will deliver you from death. And in war, from the power of the sword. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. Neither will you be afraid of death when it comes. And that's a wonderful verse in Job. But we're focusing on that uh, one part where it says, You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. So if you're living your spiritual life, you will receive the scourge of people's tongues, but God will hide you from it. You will be hidden from it, and it will not affect you. And somebody tries to destroy your reputation, it won't happen. God will protect you. And uh, this has to do a lot with faith rest, because if our country ever goes under, uh, let's look at some of the troubles that we will have. Evil will not touch you. Famine. What's famine? Economic depression. If the stock market were to collapse and we'd have uh, trouble getting a chicken in every pot, as Roosevelt said, if we started having trouble doing that, well, he'll deliver you from that. You will have enough food. But then again, if you don't, look what it says. Neither will you be afraid of death when it comes. It just means it's your time to go, but you won't be scared and you won't care. So point three, actually we, I put a point three, but we'll just make a point out of it because it's not really in order. God protects also. This is something else. God protects the pastor from verbal sins. And this is found in Isaiah 54:17. Now you'll hear a lot of people quote this passage, but this passage is actually specifically for pastors only. And it's Isaiah 54:17. And this is where it says, No weapon that is formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that accuses you in judgment, Jesus Christ will condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord and their vindication from me, decrees the Lord. In other words, the, the servant of the Lord, the one giving out Bible doctrine, no weapon formed against the pastor will prosper. No verbal accusation against the, the pastor will prosper. None of it will prosper. And the pastor will keep going until the Lord's finished with him and takes him home. And that's the way it works or until he's incapacitated with some health problem. So it is, it is important to recognize that the sins of the tongue, it is important, excuse me, it is important, this is a point two, not point two, but it's another point if you just want to write it down. It is important to recognize the sins of the tongue and separate yourself from them. Romans 16, 17 through 18 states, Now I urge you, fellow Christians, Keep your eyes on those who cause dissensions and occasions for stumbling contrary to doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For such types are not servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they are slaves to their own emotions. Furthermore, by their smooth and flattering speech, they will deceive the right lobes of the ignorant. And in this case, now the Apostle Paul could... Uh, to point out people in the congregation who are gossiping, maligning, and judging and throw them out. And also uh, deacons have this responsibility as well. So y'all better watch out for Brad over here. So let's take a look at some concluding principles. And then uh, we got a few minutes. So we'll take a look at uh, some concluding principles when it comes to the sins of the tongue. However, we're not finished with this study by no means. Point one, now this will go in order and I'll make sure. Point one, the believer guilty of slandering, maligning, or judging others is a visible loser in the Christian way of life. So if you see someone always slandering, maligning, and judging others, well, that's a visible loser in the Christian way of life. Avoid such as these, otherwise you'll, otherwise you'll get sucked into it. If you uh, get around a crowd of people who are always gossiping and maligning, well, it's inevitable. You'll get sucked into it. You have to avoid such as these, and that's what the Bible says. Point two, you cannot be occupied with the sins and failures of others 
and at the same time be occupied with Christ. The two are mutually exclusive. It cannot be done. And you cannot glorify God if you spend your time uh, with your eyes focused on people. That was point two. Point three. All believers sin after salvation, but each believer has the privacy to utilize the solution, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And a believer should be left alone concerning his sins because your sins are between you and the Lord and no one else. Absolutely no one else. And I don't ever want anybody to come up here and start talking to me about uh, your sins. I don't care about your sins. And I'm not going to tell you about mine either. That is between you and the Lord. Period. And that was point three. Point four. All believers sin after salvation. Therefore, all punishment related to those sins should be left in the hands of the Lord and we should not interfere through judging. Point five. I'll, I'll move through this uh, more quickly and just give you these points. And then tomorrow night, I'll just go right back over these, but I'll wrap it up here and just go through it uh, rapidly just so you can get a taste of it. Point five. Judging other believers interferes with the judgment and punitive action from God. Point six. When believers are judged by other believers, this becomes a source of discouragement and frustration to the victim, and it often results in irritation and loss of motivation to execute God's plan for their life. And you will be judged severely for putting a stumbling block in front of a another believer who gets discouraged. Maybe they're a young believer and they're just now starting to grow up spiritually, and so you start to talk about them in church uh, because of something they've done and they get discouraged and go home. Well, you're going to get punished severely for that. You let that person learn in privacy. Sure, they might be doing something wrong. So what? They're growing up just like all of us are. And we all need a little room and a little space to grow up. Don't get your nose in people's business. We all are at different levels spiritually and we need that space so that we can uh, uh, both go to the objective. We're all going to the same objective, by the way. Uh, we all have the same plan, by the way, and that's to execute God's plan for our life. And you say, what is that plan? That is to be filled with God the Holy Spirit and learn Bible doctrine. It's the same for all of us. Now, we all have different gifts, and we all function under those gifts, and sometimes we don't realize what our gift is until we grow up enough spiritually to know and then it becomes functional. But we have the gift of helps, the gift of administration, and all other, all other types of gifts. And uh, without those gifts, a church would not be able to function because I would collapse if I had to do everything. And then so people have different gifts to help me, and some people have the gift of helps to go to the hospital and visit people. Now, that's not my job. And if you get sick, I might come see you if I got time, but if I don't, well, that's up to people with the gift of health. You should have enough doctrine to be able to handle uh, something like that on your own. And then there are people with the gift of health who can come and comfort you if you want it. But I know a lot of times when you're in pain, you don't want to see anybody. You just want to lay there alone. But uh, it, sometimes you do want to see people. And that's just the way it goes. So point seven. Therefore, in the church age, the sins and failures of other believers must be left in the hands of the Lord for judgment, not in the hands of the self-righteous, arrogant person. <coughs> and point eight, to interfere with the function of Jesus Christ as a supreme judge in heaven is to invite disaster upon yourself. And there's some more on here, but we're running over, and uh, I, don't want, I don't want you to get too tired on me. So... Let me make a mark on my notes that where I have stopped so I can start back here. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this Wednesday evening to study your word. May these things that we have studied in the word edify our souls, and may we come to understand more clearly what it is your plan is for our life. And therefore, Father, uh, we ask these things 
In Christ's name, amen.